Well, there's not a lot of great significance in this street except for the driver who's on his uh, the debut ride as a carriage driver. I'll see if I can get a bit of a, a shot from him a bit further back to give you a perspective on it. Right, Fremantle has a large component of churches, prisons and hotels making up many of the buildings and we've got two of the churches here. The first church, the one on my right, is originally a Jewish synagogue and you can see the Star of David on the top of it. The facade at the front was put on in 1924 and it's now a building that's used as a rug centre and a shop. There are many buildings that are used for purposes much different to what they originally intended. The building we're looking at now is the Scots Presbyterian Church, which was built in the 1870s at a time when many religious denominations were building very elaborate churches in Fremantle. Unfortunately, the Presbyterians were not great in number and they had to raise a loan to build this church. And a way of paying off the loan was that they charged people to get in. It was so much to sit down the front near the minister and a little bit less to sit up the back. And that's one of the ways they used to pay off this rather elaborate church. Immediately uh, opposite us now are the Fremantle markets, a scene of lots of activity on Saturday, uh, Fridays, Friday nights and Saturday mornings, which are the only times they're open. The markets were originally built in 1897, but fell into disuse during the Depression in the 30s. They were used for many years simply as a storehouse and a warehouse, but were restored in 1975 and have been used as markets quite successfully ever since. The verandas that you can see on the markets here were put back on here about 18 months ago and have started a whole trend in getting verandas restored back to Fremantle, many of which were taken off in the 1950s. The scaffolding is, uh, is being used by tuck pointers who are currently redoing all the tuck pointing between the bricks. I'll get a shot of these cottages. Down the, like this, down the, the cottages that you see here are called the Warders Cottages and were built by convict labour in 1850-1851 and they were built to house warders from the prison, the maximum security prison which is still in existence in Fremantle and they're up until today still owned by the prisons department and still rented out to warders as, as cheap accommodation. Not all of them are occupied by waters, but some of them still are. There's a building on our left here which you can see which says Joe Sarage who's an electrical retailer. He doesn't have the whole building. The whole brick building with the veranda was completed some six weeks ago and is an illustration of the council policy of forcing people to build new buildings that blend in architecturally with the buildings that surround them. Although it hasn't got the elaborate decorativa on the outside of the building that some of our older ones have, it's certainly an attempt to to blend in with the Fremantle history and Fremantle style. As you can see, the verandas have been put back on and we hope that lots more of the buildings around here are going to re-veranda themselves, which is certainly uh, very good for a place with a hot climate like this.
Uh, coming up on the right with the clock tower is the Fremantle Town Hall. It's actually the old Fremantle Town Hall. It was a very elaborate civic administration building occupying a site beside it now. But there are some offices still used upstairs by the City Council and inside is a very beautiful auditorium with ornate carved Jarrah staircases and a very nice stage where I've been to some very good dances from time to time. The building is unusual in so much as that it's a triangular shaped building. And what we see now is one side of an equilateral triangle and the apex of which points down the main street, high street, points down what's now the pedestrian mall and down towards the roundhouse. We'll get down to the roundhouse further along on the tour. This is a shot of what used to be the high street, it's now the pedestrian mall. Okay. The fountain that you can see now is the site of the original St John's Church which has now moved about 50 or 60 metres slightly west of where it originally was and the church I believe it's when it was sitting on that fountain, the streets in Fremantle were laid out by a convict architect who I believe must have had something in for the Church of England minister because he laid out the street, the main high street, right through the middle of the church. This church was moved to its present site now in 1879 and it's a very, very beautiful church with very nice ornate stained glass and of course it, it doesn't match anything like Westminster Cathedral but it's not bad for a little town like Fremantle. The flagstones at the front of the church came from Yorkshire quarries and came out as ballast in convict boats and some of them t up until today still have broad arrows carved into the stonework. The building immediately in front of us does not have an orange crane growing out of its roof. The crane is actually about 100 metres beyond it and is part of the wharf. The, immediately behind the old railway station is of course the railway line and then that's adjacent to the wharf and the Swan River. The railway station was built in 1905 and has been the scene of much controversy since the day it was built. Getting a look here at uh, some of the, the shops and commercial area of Fremantle. Normally uh, on a, a weekday this, this street is very busy with cars going up and down and zooming around. Fremantle City Council has a policy of trying to get people out of their cars and become pedestrians and hence they have lots of one-way streets and lots of streets where to get from one side of a block to the other you have to actually go around two other blocks which tends to make life quite complicated for the motorist. I believe I'm trying to do my bit by confusing the traffic situation with this horse-drawn carriage. And we hope that more and more people will realise that what you should do in Fremantle is actually stop and get out of your car and walk around. Because it's, in fact, quite a small area that, that is contained in the city proper. And it's easily accessible on foot, or even more accessible in the horse-drawn carriage, of course. Some of the buildings here have very ornate stonework above the windows. The one in front of us has the pink bricks and the, the shell type design. A lot of that's imperial chambers and a lot of these things people just don't see in their cars when they're roaring around.
Well, I think we're back on the railway station now, and I'll give you a little bit of its history. It was originally built in 1905 on a public park, and at the time there was a large hue and cry from many people who said that the government of the day should not build a railway station on public land. Nevertheless, the government overrode the wishes of the people and went ahead and built it. In 1978, the government wished to close down the existing railway line that went the 12 miles from Fremantle to Perth, and although it was a and not a commercial operation. It was a very good service for many people, particularly the elderly and those with children. 100,000 people signed a petition to say that they wished to keep the railway going, and the government of the day once again overrode the wishes of the people and closed it, which tells you a little bit about governments, I think, or perhaps a little bit about railway stations, I'm not sure. The, the building it currently is, is empty and it's a great pity and we're hoping that in the forthcoming election if the Labor Party gets in that the railways will be reopened and restored in Fremantle. Over on, over on my right, right now, is, uh, is a monument that was built by a gentleman whose two sons perished of thirst in the desert and he wanted to provide a drinking facility for every living creature in Fremantle. So he, uh, had a horse trough constructed that had a bird bath attached and also a small opening at one end where cats and dogs could have a drink and there was a, a tap for humans to get a drink. Unfortunately, he had it designed in Italy and it was built by Royal Dalton in England but by the time it arrived here the man had passed away and some five years went by where it sat in a warehouse before somebody finally figured out how to put it together. And of course by that time there were less and less horses using the place and it became a bit of a, a white elephant around the town and it's been vandalised many, many times. Fortunately, it's been restored now to its former glory. Horse, horse feet effects. The area of town we're coming up to now is commonly known around here as the West End of Fremantle. And most of this was built in the 1890s. And it was done in a period when, in the middle of the desert, some three or four hundred miles from Perth, are two towns, Kalgoorlie and Coolgardie, which were very famous gold mining towns. And in that time, between the 1870s and the 1890s, there was something like 400,000 people living out there, which is quite an enormous number when you think of it so many hundreds of miles from the coast with no water and there was an engineer around at that time called C.Y. O'Connor who wished to build a pipeline from the foothills in Perth to Kalgoorlie to take water to them which everybody said he was quite mad to even contemplate such an idea. He also wanted to build a, a large harbour in Fremantle which at that time was simply a convict settlement in a small city at well small town at the end of the river. They said he was crazy to do that well, they're still drinking water out of that pipeline in Kalgoorlie and the boats are still coming in and out of the harbour in Fremantle. He was very much instrumental in making this city the economic centre of the West. This was down in the West End here now is where all the commerce went on and where all the trade went for backwards and forwards, particularly for the gold fields, because it was a, a, a time of very large economic boom, a time when there was lots of money around. There were many, many people coming in from different countries all over the, the world. They arrived in Fremantle by ship, stayed in some of the elaborate hotels here, caught the train the 60 or 70 miles to York and then found their way by stagecoach and foot and bicycle out to the gold fields to make their fortune. But of course there were many merchants who were dealing in those days and most of them had offices, warehouses and factories in this area of the city. It fell into dis disuse and disrepair during the 1930s and as Perth became more the centre of commercial trade and Fremantle just sort of wilted away. Many of these buildings today of course are still occupied by some of the companies that originally occupied them and many of them are empty or gradually as over the last five or six years has happened many of them be being taken over as restaurants, as craft centres. There are places where people make handmade shoes, make stringed instruments, um, 
there are art galleries, there are craft galleries, there are jewellers shops, there are professional people, dentists and doctors who are taking over some of these old buildings and turning them into workplaces. And I think it's very good that that's happening because it, it keeps the life in the buildings and they're, they're preserving them and, and up, giving them good upkeep. And now we come to the Roundhouse, the oldest public building remaining in Western Australia. It's a 12-sided building that was originally built to house incorrigible convicts and lunatics. There's a padded cell up there, well padded in the sense is that it, and rather than having limestone walls, it's got thick jarrah plank walls. And there were many atrocities um, carried out on convicts in that place and a 15-year-old boy was hung up there for committing a very minor offence indeed. Woo, mascot. The tunnel under the building was dug in the 1870s and it, by hand and it took five years to dig through that limestone cliff. It was dug by a whaling company who used to, on the immediately the other side of that hill is the, the seashore and they had a wharf out there and they used to bring whales in and drag them through that tunnel into the intersection who've just come around and cut them up and render them down for their oil. Uh, as it's so close to the sea, it must have made the rest of the, the town smell fairly unmercifully on a, a hot day when a sea breeze was blowing. In the area that we're looking at now, uh, they hope in the, in the forthcoming few years to build a small sheltered harbour in there in which to put boats like that lugger that's being restored by the Maritime Museum and the Batavia, a, a Dutch wreck from the 1600s which is in a building just in front of us that's being restored. They hope to float them out there and make that area of the foreshore a museum spot and a place where people can actually see the old boats as they were sailing. This building is built by convicts and it was the original commissariat building for the colony. People would come here and get their supplies. It's now the Maritime Museum and is gradually being restored into its former glory. It's one of only two museums in the world that has a ship from the 1600s. The other one is in Sweden. The building uh, back there, the Lionel Sampson building with the elaborate facade. Lionel Sampson was a gentleman who came to Fremantle in 1829 when the colony was first being settled and took up a grant of land there, took up two blocks of land and began trading as a liquor merchant. And to this day, the Sampson family is still trading as liquor merchants in the same site, which is 153 years, which probably isn't a great deal by English standards, but however, by Western Australian standards, it's almost complete 153 years since the original white settlers came here so Lionel the Sampson family have been around for quite a long time they uh, have contributed two mayors to the city of Fremantle and have a very very beautiful house up near the swimming pool which has been left as a museum to to the city
We don't normally come down this little laneway, but there's a fair going on on the Esplanade today with with machines that uh, have flashing lights and whir around and make lots of noise. So rather than subject my horse to that indignity, we're creeping down a bit of a back alley here. Uh, the hotel immediately in front of us, the Esplanade Hotel, was built in 1905 and it's the only hotel in Fremantle that still has its original timbered verandas and timber posts holding up those verandas. Most of the hotels in Fremantle, of which there are some 15 or 20 odd, would have had verandas like that in their original construction. However, as I said earlier on, there was a period where verandas were c considered not very nice and people tore them all off. But this gives you an idea of what architecturally a lot of the buildings would have looked like. That just about brings our little um, tour to an end. I hope you've enjoyed it. I must admit I felt quite ridiculous talking into this microphone and looking at this glass-eyed camera. However, I hope, uh, I hope it gives you some idea of, of the city of Fremantle and what it looks like and a little bit of the history. Actually, it probably gives you no idea at all, but uh, it's the best we could do at short notice. Oh boy.